Welcome to another episode of Dying in Grace, the show where we talk about that most taboo subject, death, and we reintegrate the subject of death and dying into life and living and living well. Uh, my name is Arlene Stipitat, and each week I like to bring a member of our community who has some expertise or a heartfelt experiences to share to have a conversation and inform us about some particular aspect of death and dying. And tonight I'm happy to welcome my friend Dan Flynn, who is the owner of Simply Remembered Cremation Services. So thank you so much for being a guest. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. So Dan, tell us a little bit about how you got into the business of, you know, it's not everybody's first choice. Absolutely. Um, uh, I moved here recently from Missouri, mm -hmm. where I was a death investigator and actually a subject matter expert for the federal government on mass fatality events. Uh, I came out here with my uh, lovely wife um, and we just fell in love with Santa Barbara, decided to move out I here. can't imagine why, you know, no, it's just, yeah, just versus, such a horrible yeah. place to live. Well, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I really missed the business and I got to know a wonderful lady who had started a cremation service here in Santa Barbara and her daughter, who lived in Texas, had a baby, and uh, Jeannie, the owner of the cremation service, said, that's it, I want to go be a grandma, I'm retiring. And I was lucky enough to be standing next to her when she made that decision, and I said, well, I'll buy the business from you. So uh, I sat for my uh, California license and became a licensed funeral director and took over the business in September of 2017. Now, she had been in business for about eight years prior to that here in Santa Barbara. Right. But um, just being a death investigator, you already had a comfortability with death doing yeah. that. And, and how, I mean, when you started out in your career, when they said, well, now you're going to investigate that death, I mean, how did you start to get comfortable in that well, whole it, arena? Because it's not easy for people. Well, it's interesting because. Um, uh, there are different aspects of dealing with the deceased. Uh, there's the sights, there's the sounds, there's the smells. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I found very early on is either that bothers you or it doesn't. It's not like it's something that it bothers you at first and you get used to. Your very first case, it, you know whether or not this is something you can do. So. Um, Certainly the sights and the sounds and the smells are not always pleasant, but it's something that you can either handle from the, the get-go or you can't. So I'm wondering, do you hold all of this, whether it's the cremation work or the work you, work you did as a death investigator, as like this service, like this is something I can give to a community or to the country when you're working for the federal, that other people can't do? I mean, is there a part of you that very much so, very much so. Um, a lot of times you see, uh, you know, the, the first responders that we think of. Right. Firemen. Right, uh, right. Who I admire greatly. Uh, firemen are trained to save people. But when there's no one to save, um, you know, they can get very despondent right. and very upset because they were there to save people. Um, but when you look at situations like the September 11th, you know, uh, World Trade Center, there was nobody to save. And interestingly enough, even search and rescue dogs, when they can't find someone alive, they get so depressed they can't work. Mm. So I found that I had um, the ability to bear that burden that other people not, might not be able to. So I lent myself to that and said, you know, you guys are better at saving people, and I'll be the first one to say, I don't know anything about what paramedics do, or nurses, or doctors. Uh, to me, medical training is something you either do full-time or you don't. So I wouldn't know the first thing about handling uh, a sick person, or a traumatized person, or uh, uh, what we would call a mass casualty event. Right, uh, right. That's a whole nother thing. So. I said, well, I can handle the mass fatalities. I can handle working with the deceased, so I will lend myself to that. Well, that's a unique gift, and um, 
you know, an unusual calling, I think. And I do see it as a calling. You know, working with, with the, the dying, whether it's people alive in that process um, or working with families after that or anywhere on that spectrum, not everybody can do that. It is, it is a gift to be able to do that. And I think um, it's a unique opportunity that we have. Well, um, uh, and, and I absolutely agree with you. Uh, so one of the things that I realized very early on is if you, you know, you think I've worked in disasters mm -hmm. uh, for quite a while and I've dealt with people who have lost their homes or lost um, um, their family members, that sort of thing through, let's say, hurricanes or tornadoes. Right, right, right. But in working with people who have lost a loved one, that is the most desperate hour of someone's life. Yes. And I feel that that's what I offer, is that, that I'm able to, to help people um, in their most desperate hour. And I think the, the greatest compliment that I've received uh, from people is that I've made that most desperate hour a little bit easier to bear or a little bit easier to handle. Yes. Um, and certainly preparing, either deciding what as a person is dying, you know, ha to have a cremation or after the fact when someone's died um, suddenly, that is a huge burden and you need someone that can guide you. So cremation, let, let's just talk about that because it seems to be much more on the rise, at least, I mean, I know years ago, people kind of looked askance even, you know, you were gonna get buried in the ground, my parents got buried in the ground, you know, nobody even really, cremation was not really talked about when I was coming up, and yet now it's, it's, it's risen. So could you talk to us about why you think that is and what the national trends are about cremation and what you see here in California? Yeah, um, here in California, of course, we lead the nation in cremations. Um, the state of California, statewide, we're up at around 64% cremation. Here in the Santa Barbara area, we're actually, uh, if you just look at Southern California, it's almost 90%. Wow. Um, and in 2017, the United States as a nation went over 51% cremation. So obviously we're, we're uh, drugged down quite a bit by uh, the southeastern states uh, that where land is much cheaper, uh, religion tends to be a, a lot more of a factor. So, uh, but in 2017, uh, we joined that world stage where uh, the majority of our dispositions are cremation. Uh, certainly you look at countries like Japan and India where it's basically at 100%. Mm -hmm. Japan because of the amount of land that's available right. and India because it's required by law, uh, by religious law in mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are now over 51% as a nation. So, you know, what are the most common fallacies people have about what happens in cremation or the, or the kind of the, the questions that people ask you that are kind of off the wall? Yeah, I, one of my favorite things is, is what I call myth busting. Um, uh, hopefully that's not trademarked. But, um, I love to answer people's questions. And when I'm sitting with a family and we're doing the paperwork for a loved one, I can see on their faces that there's questions, they, I've always heard this, or what do you do about that, or is it true you do this? And I love those kinds of questions. Uh, my favorite, of course, is the gold teeth. Um, what do you do about gold teeth? Because there's this urban legend that, you know, the, the funeral director late at night is down in the basement and he's pulling people's teeth to get the gold. Uh, we actually had a woman one day come in and say, I've got $16,000 worth of gold in my mouth and when I die, I want my teeth pulled so that my family can use that gold to pay for my funeral arrangements. And I said, well, you have the legal right to ask for those gold teeth. There's you know, no question there. However, while you may have paid the dentist $16,000, you have about $96 worth of gold in your mouth. The rest of it is a tin alloy, and the rest of it went to pay for the dentist's Mercedes-Benz. Um, but again, you have the legal right to ask for those teeth. 
but the law also states that I can't pull them. So we have to hire a forensic dentist to come extract those teeth post-mortem, and therefore uh, he charges like $3,000 to extract that $96 worth of gold that your family might get out of it. So that usually ends the conversation. Uh, the other questions we get are about how hot does the retort get? And by the way, we don't use the word oven. We don't use the word furnace. We use the medical term retort. Um, and that's um, the? The cremation chamber. Okay. okay. And people ask how hot does it get, that sort of thing. And the answer to that is about 1800 degrees. Um, and the average person is cremated within uh, hour and a half, two hours. Um, so, uh, and then a lot of people don't realize that when the cremation process is over, what remains is the skeleton. All the soft tissue mm -hmm. is burned away through the heat process and the skeleton is, is very dried out, obviously, and very brittle. So you could literally pick up one of the bones and it just crumbles in your hand. So those bones are then gathered up and are processed into a fine powder. And, and when, so when you receive the ashes of your loved one, that is their skeleton that has been processed down to a fine powder. And California law states that there can't be anything that's recognizable. And mm -hmm. so in other words, you can't pull out a finger bone or something like that. Uh -huh. Everything has to be ground down to the point where it's not recognizable. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Somehow I didn't think about that, you, you know, that, 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 that there were, I guess I thought that the, the tort, retort, mm -hmm. did the whole job. I didn't realize that you had to do another step two to grind the skeleton down. We also, so, so we also the, never say grind. Uh, <laughs> we say process. Well, right. Okay. So but that's I'm, what happened, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So, so when I receive the ashes of a loved one, I'm really receiving is the processed skeleton. You're, you're receiving the bone. The uh, bone, right. right. Okay. Because right. so so all the soft tissue has been gone. burned away. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things I know that that you like to say about about your particular uh, service is that it's eco friendly, mm -hmm. and could you talk a little bit about what that might mean? And and also, um, uh, before that too, I, I, I want to talk about what people do with with the ashes. So they, you know, people pick out pretty urns, or you know, they sure. sometimes you get them in a box and. You know, there's been like the big Lebowski, you know, spreading the ashes and they blow back in the face, you know, that kind of thing. So, so what, it, what are the options once I, I've chosen cremation sure. or for me or a family member, what happens next? What's, what's step two? The ash, I, if somebody gets the ashes, then what can we do? Sure. Well, let's start by saying in the United States, currently, there are only two things you can do, burial or cremation. And what I mean by that is in other countries, like Nepal, you may have heard of a sky funeral where the body is actually left out right. on a mountaintop to allow the, 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 the vultures, the vultures and, and you know the, the birds of the air and the creatures of the field to consume the remains. And it's a whole you know circle of life kind of thing. Right. Not allowed in the United States. We also don't allow uh, funeral pyres as they do in India. India, right. Right. So um, it's either burial or cremation. Uh, burial, pretty straightforward, though we can talk about green burials. Uh, as far as cremation goes, um, when you're talking about heat cremation, you, you have these ashes left. And what's interesting, I, I always find interesting, is that people ask how much is left in the ashes. And it has nothing to do with how tall you are, how short you are, how skinny or fat you are, whether you're a man or a woman. It has to do with your heritage. If I had two men standing here, they were the exact same size and build, and one of them was of Norwegian descent, and one of them was Latino. The Norwegian man's ashes would weigh about 12 pounds, and the Latinos would weigh about four pounds, four to six pounds. And the reason for that is the, the Scandinavian person, um, uh, from generations of a cold climate and a high dairy diet, they've literally evolved with denser bones. So they're big boned. You're a big bone person. Not, well, not big, but dense. Denser dense bones. bones. And then the person from the, uh, a Latino country, because it's a warmer climate, and, and we're talking 
of course, evolutionary. A hun yes, yeah, hundred evolutionary. generations. Mm -hmm. um, the the bones uh, may be the exact same size, but they're not as dense. So the ash that's left over is different. And I can basically at this point just pick up somebody's urn and know where they were from. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something I never even thought about. That's yeah. fascinating. So now, as far as what can you do with uh, the remains, or as we say, cremains. Cremains, okay. Cremains. Um, that's one of the, if I can use the word fun, that's one of the fun things about cremation. There's no limit. Um, I can put you in a golf ball. I can put you in a shotgun shell. I can shoot you into space. I can take some of your ashes and have them made into a diamond ring. I don't mean a fake diamond ring. I mean an actual diamond. If you think about it, a diamond is created when a small amount of carbon is subjected to a great deal of pressure and heat over a long period of time. Uh, a company, uh, there's two companies actually, one in Chicago and one in Texas, that has actually developed a way to take a small amount of the cremains, which are just carbon, and uh, subject them to a million pounds per square inch of pressure under a high degree of heat for a year and they actually form a real diamond, which they can then craft into a diamond ring. So your loved one can be made into a diamond ring. So there's that. Um, as far as more normal. Uh, and it's all for a price, of course. You can do it. Oh, right? absolutely. But yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, but as far as the more run of the mill, everyday yeah. types of things, um, in the state of California, uh, you can scatter at sea. Um, and it, what's interesting is when you talk about other parts of the country, uh, in order to scatter somebody's ashes at sea, uh, you have to take the ashes three miles offshore. But in California, because we have such a, a big surfer community, they actually changed that regulation in California to 500 yards instead of three miles. Because I can paddle a surfboard out, well not me, but somebody in shape, could paddle a surfboard out 500 yards, but you can't paddle a surfboard out three miles. So it's very common in the surfer community when one of their own passes, they have them cremated, all of his buddies paddle out and they form this big circle and have this ceremony and scatter the ashes. So, so the surfer community changed California law so they could honor their, or help to change it. I think. have to think that at some point there was a, a surfer slash legislator that got that change. Surfer dude. A surfer dude, but it would be the honorable surfer dude right. because he was you know, elected official. But uh, yeah, in California. But I like that because yeah. it's, it's the ritual. And, right. and I think part of the whole idea of what, what we do with remain, cremains is what's the ritual that mm. we want? You know, what's the way? So you can do the C. Um, can you scatter ashes in your backyard? Well, that's a very good question. In, uh, again, in California, you can scatter ashes on land. However, you have to have permission from the landowner. So what does that mean? If you wanted to scatter ashes in your own backyard, that's fine. We have urns that will grow your loved one's ashes into wildflowers. We have uh, an urn that will grow your loved one's ashes into a tree. But a lot of people here in Santa Barbara say, well, I'd like to scatter their ashes up in the mountains. Well, the mountains belong to the National Forest Service and the National Forest Service says no. So you don't have permission from the landowner. A so lot of that never happens then, people never break the law that way, right? La, 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 la. <laughs> yes. So, um, and a lot of people say, well, I, what about scattering them on the beach? You know, I just want uh -huh. to stand on the beach and scatter them into the waves. Well, the, the beaches belong to the State Park Service, and the State Park Service says no. So, uh, as far as I know, it never happens. Right. Everyone obeys the law, no one speeds. Uh, right, right, yes, right, there you exactly. Go. So, um, uh, now, Conversely, though, I, I find it interesting that in California, they don't allow this, but when you go to Florida where they're trying to rebuild the reef system, the coral reef system, right. they encourage people to actually have their ashes put into artificial reefs. Uh, but in California, they don't allow that because here in California, there's no rebuilding of artificial reefs, that sort of thing, so they don't want you doing that. Now, 
just to touch on one more point about burial at sea, you can actually have a full body burial at sea. Uh, now that is the same wherever you go, it's three miles offshore, but uh, you can have a burial at sea, whether it be in a casket, uh, it has to be a specially designed casket sure. for that, or you can even just use a shroud, you know, one of kind of like a canvas sleeping bag, if right. you will, that the body goes in, some weights are added, usually some anchor chain, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, but you can still bury a, a, do a full body burial at sea. So kind of what I hear you saying too, I mean, when, when you're talking about, I, I have an urn where you can grow a tree or grow wildflowers, that is part of, it seems to me like an ecological approach to, to burial. And, so. um, you know, can you talk a little bit about green burial? You know, what, I've sure. heard that term, what, what does that mean? Green burial uh, is, is a, a, a movement, if you will. As a matter of fact, the National Green Burial Council is headquartered in Ojai, just up the hill. And um, <clears throat> what a green burial means is that there's no embalming, or if there is embalming, it's through uh, non-toxic chemicals, as opposed to traditional embalming fluid is highly toxic. Um, and, and that eventually is going to leach into the ground system. Um, so there are uh, either no embalming or green embalming fluid, no metal caskets, and no vaults. So if you've been to a funeral service, a graveside service at a traditional cemetery, the, you'll notice that the, the casket is lowered into a concrete vault, right. and then a lid is put on that. The only reason for a vault is so that the ground won't settle and therefore the uh, cemetery staff has an easier time cutting the grass. Mm. So uh, uh, one of the things that absolutely amazes me is that here I am in S Santa Barbara, California, um, and, and for somebody from Missouri, this is like being in hippie central. <laughs> and there is not one cemetery in all of Santa Barbara County that allows green burials. Yet. Yet. And the only reason that they don't allow them is so that they can cut the grass easier. Well, so, so there'll be a movement on that because I those borders are, so. are getting out. Um, and, and there's new trends, new, new things coming down, um, other approaches. So besides the um, traditional heat, there's, a, there's something new coming down the pike. Is that Absolutely. accurate? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, starting July 1st of 2020, California will become the 14th state to allow alkaline hydrolysis, or put more simply, water cremation. So now this is a process that's been used for years at medical schools for bodies that have been donated. You know, we all know about people donating their, their bodies to right, science, right. which normally means that your body is gonna to go to a medical school and be used to help train doctors. Right. So as soon as they're they've gotten all the use of you as they can, um, they use alkaline hydrolysis. And what alkaline hydrolysis is, or we can call it uh, liquid cremation, we can call it water cremation, but it is a high alkaline solution. And, and um, for those of your viewers who might not be familiar with high alkaline, I'm old enough to remember my grandmother talking about washing clothes in lye soap. Right, yes. So lye soap was a high alkaline solution. And if you've ever worked with lye soap, if you hold it in your bare hand, it'll actually burn your burn hand. Burn your skin, yeah. It'll burn your skin. So in alkaline hydrolysis, the body is put into a large silver tube, if you will, and, and uh, then the tube is filled with a solution of water and lye soap. And after about three hours, it completely dissolves all the soft tissue just like heat cremation, and what's left over is the skeleton. And just like in heat cremation, the skeleton is then processed to a fine powder and is returned to the family. So when this new law kicks in, will Simply Remembered be able to, to offer that, um, or eventually you'll be able to offer that to our community, or it'll take a while because it's a new technology? No, I tell you, I hope to, well, uh, the technology's already out there. The reason that they've held off until 2020 is to allow the state of California a chance to educate its inspectors 
on they have to know enough to actually inspect the facilities as they do currently with heat cremation. So we're actually giving uh, the regulators a chance to catch up with the technology, but the technology is out there. I recently attended the National Alkaline Hydrolysis Conference um, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, New York, or Rochester, Minnesota, and got to see the process firsthand. And again, UCLA Medical School, their body donation program has been using alkaline hydrolysis for several years already. So um, to answer your question, the problem that we have here locally is that, for instance, with heat cremation, um, Santa Barbara County won't allow any more crematories in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, and, and they use the excuse of air quality. So uh, we come under the Air Quality Standards Board and uh, they just won't allow any permits to be issued for uh, a retort. So with the new alkaline hydrolysis, uh, it doesn't come under the Air Quality Standards Board anymore, but you do have to have a permit from the local uh, sewer district. Well, Dan, this has all been fascinating and we'll have to have you back to tell us some more. Um, so thank you. I mean, Simply Remembered Cremations, we'll have your website up. Is it, I just want to thank you so much for offering your expertise and your unique gift. Uh, what we invite all of our, our uh, guests to do is to sign this book of living love. We say to live in hearts, we leave behind is not to die. So we'd like to invite you to do that. And we're so grateful um, for uh, your services, your unique gift to the community. It's um, something um, that we need. And I, my intention is to be cremated and hopefully I'll last long enough to try this water thing. That sounds kind of cool. And then what else right. we do with my remains? Well, I'll have to you know, Think about it. on the water cremation, we actually refer to it as your final spa treatment. Well, there you go. So. I'll have to get a few more before that point, <laughs> I hope. Uh, but thank you so much for being our guest. And I would like to thank uh, TVSB for allowing us to do this wonderful show. I want to thank all our viewers. You can watch past episodes of Dying in Grace at dyingingrace.com or on YouTube, Dying in Grace. And I'd love to thank my crew, Elliot Jacobson and Leander Harris for your support. Uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching.